Good morning. Daniel chapter 7. Beasts. Have you enjoyed the beasts? Weird things happen in the middle of the night in the Middle East, apparently. I don't know if Daniel ate bad pizza, had a pastrami sandwich too late, but he had weird dreams. And these dreams have been recorded, or actually directly revealed by God to him. And in the process of all of that, we have a 2,600-year record of what he wrote. And we're going to explore the last part of Daniel 7 this week. So as we finish today, we're going to reflect on the first three sessions very, very briefly here. I'm doing a kind of a short review. First of all, we learned about the four beasts, each representing an ancient kingdom as part of the times of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles. These beasts were emblematic, emblematic, I should say, of ancient Babylon, followed by ancient Persia, and then ancient Greece, and then finally, ancient Rome. We explored, and one of the commentators had a great word for this, the elastic ties, the elastic ties of the fourth beast to both ancient Rome, as well as a future coming kingdom, which we will learn is all about the Antichrist. He will set his rule up over the entire earth at some point, and there will literally be three and a half years of hell on the planet. These future kingdoms, which some commentators believe are more nation states, large regions, regional uh, entities, are represented by the ten horns that we saw in Daniel 7 as well, eventually overtaken by the little horn, which we talked about more last week. These horns will represent these ten nations or regional concerns with the emergence, of course, of the little horn, which we learned is the false messiah. God's judgment is sure. God's judgment is sure. It is righteous, it is perfect, and it is coming. Buckle up. The final look at Daniel 7 steps us through the end of the times of the Gentiles and into the great throne room. We're going to have a chance to see the throne. There we will encounter the end of the fourth beast and much, much more. This is kind of our centering point today as we get started. This is called the fourth beast's last stand, kind of like Custer's last stand, except for this one is going to be interesting. So in Daniel 7.21, we're going to capture the last seven or eight verses of chapter 7, not necessarily in the chronological order in which they are given in Daniel 7. We're going to be jumping around a little bit. This is the start of the judgment, but again, it's not chronological. So if you see the verses seemingly out of order, I did the best I could to put a chronology together from other verses and other books to make this a little bit fuller picture. Remember I told you a few weeks ago that the book of Daniel, really the entire scripture, is really a large mosaic. The mosaic is made of many beautiful pieces. Our job is to study the scripture with all of our hearts, all of our effort, so that we can put this picture together. Because God tells us, if you search for me, you will find me. You can read chronologically, which we all do, or just, you know, open up the book of Genesis and go all the way through the book of Revelation at some point, which is great. But the scripture isn't really built like that. It's really built to be studied in different contexts. Ezekiel might relate to Isaiah, which might relate to something in Revelation. We're going to see some of that coming up today. In verse 21 in chapter 7, Daniel kept looking. I kept looking, and this phrase happens 10 times in this vision. I kept looking. In other words, Daniel's telling us, I'm studying this vision really hard. And we don't know, because we know at the beginning he's laying on his bed. So I don't know if this is some kind of a big, huge, big screen, wide screen, or if it's, we don't know what it's like in the spirit. We have no clue. 
You can see bits and pieces of it. But this is a very spiritual vision. We are entering the world of the spirit here. And we have to ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. So please close your eyes and bow your heart for just a moment as we seek the spirit's guidance. Lord, we thank you for this time. We ask you, Lord, for your Ruach HaKodesh to descend on this place today and open up our minds and our hearts. Give us clarity, give us guidance and discernment, Lord, to your word, that we might, Lord, take this to heart in being able to use it, Father, to glorify you in everything that we do. In Yeshua's name, amen. So remember that Daniel is writing from a sixth century perspective. He is looking back and he's looking forward at the same time. He, he's got the history of the Babylonians in view. He's got the future in view as well. But he's taking all of it and recording it for us so we can follow. And the good news is there are plenty of examples throughout the scripture that give us supporting data on this vision. His work is prophecy looking forward to the end. The saints are the holy ones that are mentioned here the Kiddushin in Aramaic, or the Kiddushim, I believe it is in the Hebrew, or either could be Jews, a lot of people believe they are, or if you take the pre-wrath perspective, they are Jews and believers that are caught at that time under the power of the Antichrist. I am not going to get into a detailed description of that piece of it, but that will be coming at some point in the future. We also know by this time, the Antichrist has overcome three of the other kings. Those are three of the horns that were overcome of the 10. And he now has worldwide control. We can look today at our political, social, and economic environment and draw a lot of lessons from what's going on in Europe, what's going on literally in almost every government in the world. Things are not the same as they were a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago. Things have changed quite a bit. But we also have to keep aware that we must avoid at all costs what we call front page exegesis. Just because it's in the press doesn't necessarily mean it's prophecy. It might be, it might be, but we have to remember that we can't get too wrapped up. And I've got friends that send me stuff all the time. Look at this Bible prophecy right there. And it might be, but not everything is. So just take a step back, get your favorite drink, read and study. This little horn, by the way, is going to be quite a fierce beast all by himself. We will, we will see in the scripture, as we go through the verses today, the end of him, which is a great thing. So the old story is I've got good news and I've got bad news. There's going to be hell to pay on earth, but the good news is it's going to come to an end. And Yeshua himself, who we're going to see today, is going to reign and rule over Jerusalem. And that's good news for all of us. This there is a reference to a little horn coming up in chapter 8 also, which we'll be getting into next week. And for now, this one has been identified, the one we're seeing today as the false messiah or the antichrist as we know. The, uh, the little horn in chapter 8 is likely going to be one of the old Greek kings, and I'm sure Chuck is going to be covering that as he gets through chapter 8. The Antichrist war is mainly against the Jews because remember this, you wipe the Jews out, you have destroyed the promises of God, and thus you have made God a liar. Jews and Messianic believers are targets of the enemy. If you are being targeted in any way, harassed, picked on, pushed around, the believers in the first century would have said, praise the Lord, because the way they looked at it was the persecution meant that God was working in your life. I don't like persecution, and I don't like 
being pushed around. I don't like pain. I'm not good at it. But each one of us has to put all of this in perspective. We're going to jump to Revelation. We're going to see some parallel passages here that will link all of this together. In Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So for a while, he is going to be successful. It is going to be bloody. It is going to be violent. It is going to be ugly. And authority was given to him, and that's an important point here. The Antichrist can only take as much authority as God gives him. Any angelic host, including Satan himself, is only given enough power to further God's program. It sounds weird, but God, remember, at the basis of all this, God remains in control of all of it. He remained in control through 15 votes for the Speaker of the House last night. He remained in control of Klaus Schwab and all of his clowns in Europe. He only gives them enough power that they will eventually do his will. Do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember that our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is there with the Lord God himself. Amen? Amen. I feel like a Baptist this morning. God will give him authority for a very short time, though it will seem an eternity to the people alive at the time. Persecution is never easy. I keep thinking in terms of what happened during the Holocaust. If you were pulled out of your home, thrown into a cattle car, and transported to a concentration camp, it must have felt like the Holocaust at the time. But who knows if it felt to them like the tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel. When you are faced with those kinds of circumstances, you may not be able to distinguish it. If you know your Bible, you would be. We don't know. We do know this. There was a very active and very strong and powerful messianic movement in Europe before the war. One book that I have in my bookshelf numbered those believing Jews in the millions. Other scholars will say it was in the hundreds of thousands, but nevertheless, there were robust, strong Messianic congregations made up of Jews and Gentiles back then that went through the Holocaust. Did they know? Could they distinguish this hell on earth they went through in the camps from what the scripture said was going to happen? I don't know, but I know it was pretty nasty. In verse 8, all who live on the earth will worship him. There's an indication of what's coming up. This is going to be a man who's going to head a false religion. Because God needs to bring this stuff to the fore. And he needs to force people to see the truth. Will you be able to stand and distinguish between a false god and the one true god? The only way you're going to know is by knowing your scripture. If you're reading, you're studying, you're spending time in fellowship, you will learn what it takes. This walk is not easy. We are challenged every day. The earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written since the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slaughtered. So we know here, Daniel writing 2,600 years ago or thereabouts, is looking thousands of years into the future in the spirit. And isn't it interesting that he's looking at this as if it has already happened? This book is written. You can take this to the bank or your credit union, whatever one you want to do. Revelation 19.19. 19. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him. Where did they assemble, by the way? We haven't, 
I could, I could run this thing out for hours. I could have put a hundred slides. I won't do that to you. You're gathering at Armageddon or Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo. That will be the gathering place for the armies, which we'll be getting into later in Revelation. Where are they going to go? Their goal is to wipe the Jews out. Where do you find the Jews? You find the Jews in Jerusalem. We have a lot of songs this morning that we sang about the mountains around Jerusalem as the Lord is around his people. That is the holy mountain. That is, in my opinion, we could take this one up later with the astrophysicists, the center of the universe. God will put his feet there in Jerusalem when that temple is built, described in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. And by the way, every man, nation, tribe, and tongue, God's diversity program, as I like to call it, will be welcome in the temple of God because God does not see Jew and Gentile in the context of his people. Yes, there are differences. He will make a place for every one of us as long as we are willing to be obedient to his call. I love obedience, but sometimes it hurts. Hmm. Every will be assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. I don't, we all struggle with God, right? Sometimes you have a moment or two and we all get a little rebellious. But fighting God is not on my agenda. And I hope it's not on yours. As I like to say, go with the flow, right? Let the Lord lead. Honor him and worship him. And remember that he prefers obedience rather than sacrifice. Obedience means you listen. In fact, one of the commands in Deuteronomy 27, which I'm going through right now, has to say, be quiet and listen. Be quiet and listen. Let's move on. And the beast, this is in verses 20 and 21, was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast. Remember, the mark of the beast comes through deception. You don't have to look far to see an economic system right over the horizon. If you're doing electronic banking, if you are tied into the electronic system, it will not be a leap. But I don't see how anybody's going to be able to avoid it. And if you can't buy and sell, that brings a whole other host of problems. How is that going to work? I don't know. But this false prophet performed the signs in his presence, in which, by the way, he was given enough power and freedom to do so, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. Those, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. These verses match, we'll go into 21 here, they match the judgment sequence of Daniel 7. It's imperative for the believer, the reader and student of prophecy to understand the linkages between the two. Hopefully, by these sermons and studies, whatever you want to call them, we have provided a way in to help you decode Revelation. A lot of people are afraid to study Revelation. People will say, well, it's so symbolic. There's all these images and all these things, but the scripture eventually will interpret itself if you take the time and you are patient. Not necessarily high on my list. If and when we encounter anyone, be they Jewish or Gentile, we will be able to draw parallels and linkages. This is where some of the application for this comes in. If you can draw the parallels between the Old and the New Testament, you become a more equipped soldier for God because these are the weapons of the Spirit. Having the weapons of the Spirit gives you the capability of fighting the fight. And it's not necessarily with guns or swords, but it is with the Word of God. 
This is how we correctly divide the word of God. Moving on into Daniel 7. Again, going back to Daniel 7, verse 11. This is the little horn that I kept looking because of the sound. Again, Daniel continues working hard at understanding the vision. Comprehension. I used to teach a speed reading and comprehension training program my earlier years, my previous life. Teaching people to read a little quicker is one thing. Being able to teach people to understand what they're reading is something entirely different. Comprehension is really what the game is all about, understanding what you're reading. And not only understanding what you're reading, but what do you do with it when you get it? Can you use it? Can it be practical in your life? That's one of the things that has continued to work on my soul. So what do I do with this information? Especially when you're around people who don't care. Sometimes you just have to shake the dust off your feet and move on, and that's where it's, where it's going to go. So I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words, which the horn was speaking, and I kept looking until the beast was killed, hallelujah, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. So there is an end to this individual's time on the planet. At this point, the vision, in the vision, the beast is the primary focus of the judgment. There will be others judged, of course, as we know. But this is where Daniel takes us, up to the judgment of the beast. This fourth beast meets his eternal destiny here. He is heaved into the burning fire later, further explained in the book of Revelation. The constant boasting, and one of the pieces here I wanted to get across to you. The beast is a boaster. He's a boasting beast. He loves to brag about what he's going to do and what he has done. Be aware, as believers, we temper our words not to be boastful, not to be arrogant or prideful. It is a hard thing to remember what we're on this earth to do, loving one another. This constant boasting is repeated several times, and we're reminded that we are never ever to boast. It is a poor witness by the believer to be boastful. In fact, the perspective serves us well to always guard what we say and how we say it. I have been counseled on more than one occasion by a person very close to me that my voice sometimes gets a little bit of a tone in it. And I have to remember that sometimes I don't know what I'm putting out there. So it's a warning to all of us to be very careful what we say and how we say it, and approach one another with love. That's what this congregation is about in John 13, 35. For those that need a reminder of the congregational verse, they will know us by the love we show for one another. Patience, kindness, and love. If we're not about that, we're about nothing. I don't care how much knowledge we've got. So by the time this beast is in full effect, he is driven by Satan's power. But we also know, too, Satan is a boaster and a usurper and a desire of power. I don't ever want power. Too much responsibility. Let's move on to Daniel 7, 12. The beast is judged. And as for the rest of the beasts, remember Babylon, followed by Persia, followed by Greece, and later followed by Rome, which, of course, is the subject here, their dominion will be taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. There will be a little more of Greece, a little more of Persia, and a little more of whatever Babylon became before they are fully, completely judged as well. These other beasts are vestiges of these ancient empires, and at some point in time, God will judge them as well. Think about this. Today's modern Iran are the vestiges of ancient Persia. Today's modern Greece have the vestiges of the ancient Grecian Empire. In modern Babylon, or I should say Iraq or Syria, that whole area there in the Middle East, we would know it as Mesopotamia in the scripture. We know that ancient religions and ancients, ancient schools of thought and all of that still exist. And you can see some of that in things like astrology, and witchcraft, 
and any other false form of religion or faith. Where are you going to find the truth? Between your Bible. Now we're going to get into the throne room, and this is where it gets exciting. I love this. The throne of God. I could go on for hours on this because the scripture is filled. I, when you do the research, you begin to realize there's a lot more going on here that I realized. I'm going to give you an overview here, starting in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. So now Ezekiel, one of the captives that went to Babylon with Daniel, is getting visions along with Daniel. This is interesting. God's at work. God's really at work here. Now there was an expanse that was over their heads. There was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that, which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Remember that Ezekiel and Daniel are writing what they see. They may not always fully grasp everything that's going on, but they're giving us what they see. So this throne room vision here is going to go a couple of different places. Let's take a look and see what else God has in store for us this morning. In verse 27 that I noticed, from the appearance of his waist, a physical description now coming up, Upward, something like gleaming metal that looked like fire all around with it, within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw something like fire. And there was a radiance around him. This could have been lifted directly out of the book of Revelation. These images, these visions tie us together. So hopefully, at some point, when you pick up the book of Revelation again, it's going to make more sense and a little bit less intimidating. There are something between 400 and 800 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And when you understand your Old Testament, your Hebrew scriptures or Tanakh, whatever word we choose to use here, when you understand the prophets and the writings, the Psalms, especially the Psalms, even go back to the Torah, there are heavenly visions in the book of Exodus I was shocked to see. Moses and the 70 elders and Aaron went up to have a nice meal with God while they were in the desert. So God's eternal throne is visible from the very beginning of the scripture all the way through into the end. Why does he give us a throne vision or two or ten? Because he wants us to always remember that there is an end to this and we are going to be spending time with him in eternity. The throne is our home. The throne is our home. It gives me hope, because if we don't have hope, we're nothing. Hope gives us the future. We know we're going to suffer on the way, but we have a hope, and that's why this is recorded for us. The radiance around him that Ezekiel records in verse 27. Let's look at verse 28. Like the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds. By the way, God called today. I got a direct message, a a text message from him. He wants his rainbow back. He wants his rainbow back. It's been hijacked and stolen by people that don't know him. Rainbow made up of all colors that exist. Like the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so is the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Now, I cannot imagine what he saw. He's doing the best he can, Ezekiel is, to describe what he's seeing. But this is the appearance, he says, the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice speaking. That's where we belong, is on our face and on our knees. There is no question in my mind, Ezekiel is describing the pureness of holiness. Ask God for forgiveness as often as you can, because this is where we're headed and God cannot tolerate sin. We don't talk about sin enough, probably need to do it more. I don't want to give you too much negative but it's out there. You see it every day. This is where we're headed. 
The voice is speaking. Now, we meet the Ancient of Days in verse 9, and I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. You know what he's describing here? He's describing Elijah's chariot. The wall, the wheels going, the fire. Take a look at his, Elijah's vision. You'll see a lot of the same method, uh, same, the same um, use of language. We are looking at God's throne. Amen, right? Daniel 9, 7, 9 tells us that the Ancient of Days is going to sit the court down. And this is where things get interesting. There is no doubt who this is. The commentators sometimes will say, well, this might be Yeshua, it might be the Father. I, te I tend to believe this is the Father because a second personage, a second individual is going to appear in a few minutes. In the ancient literature, some discovered in the Dead Sea that there's much written about the Ancient of Days, including, believe it or not, there was found in the Dead Sea, the Book of Giants. Some of you have a copy of that. Other pieces of literature that emerged out of the Dead Sea, the first book of Enoch. And a lot of this imagery shows up in those extra biblical texts. While there's some debate, again, about the personage, we know there will be a second that will appear in a few minutes. Within these passages, the judgment is first negative against the little horn of the fourth beast, and then positive in favor of the Son of Man. So God will pull the contrast. He'll show you this, and then he's going to show you that. In fact, it reminds me of the chiastic structure that Daniel is actually built in. We talked about this several months ago. Chapter 2 mirrors chapter 7, right? Chapter 3 mirrors chapter 6, and chapter 4 and chapter 5 are mirrors of one another. When you understand that, you understand that the human mind that likes chronology and step-by-step -step is not going to be satisfied with that, but rather you've got to step back and look at this from God's perspective. It's a different way to organize information. There's probably a great spreadsheet out there that you can sort it a million different ways, and maybe that's what this is really about. Within these passages, the judgment is first negative, as I mentioned. It's going to go positive and negative and positive and negative. There is much contrast and comparison between these various images. So who's occupying the thrones here? As we're going to get into that in just a moment. We can see is one really good scholar that I love, Dr. Michael Heiser, who wrote a book called The Unseen Realm. He suggests that there may be, these may be members of the Divine Council, which we're going to see uh, shortly. There may be angels involved. There may be uh, the various tribes and the various apostles will be possibly there as well. In ancient biblical uh, rabbinical tradition, there is evidence linking the Son of Man, who we're going to see in just a moment, to the Messiah. However, we define who he is. We believe we know who he is because the scripture tells us so. But there are those that do not understand that. Let's move on. From Revelation chapter 1, his head and his hair were white like white wool, uh, like, white wool his, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Again, you've got to believe that John is looking at the book of, uh, book of Daniel. John's reading. He's been to the library, and he's looking at the book of Daniel, and suddenly he's swept up in the spirit. I don't know how else to put this. But the imagery is so tight, you can't ignore it. And in verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze. When it has been heated to a glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Do you remember when the children of Israel were standing at the mountain receiving the Torah? Remember the terror and the fear that they experienced? This is the voice they heard. Terror and fear. And by the way, not a bad thing to be afraid. Not a bad thing to have terror. Because you are standing in the midst of a holy God. If we had a little more fear and a little more terror about our daily walk, I think we would be that much better off. We might take things just a little bit too much for granted. Yeshua's physical presence is never really discussed. Imagine Daniel's vision or John's venture into the spirit and encountering these incredible images. Any description may well reference the holiness and eternality. So the hair and the whiteness, all of this stuff, dealing with the physical appearance, has possibly more to deal with holiness and the eternal state. 
In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of, the, out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. So Revelation giving us great detail, explaining Daniel even further. Let's move on to the one called like the Son of Man. In Daniel 7.13, the Son of Man appears. There are many, many pictures that artists have taken the time to do the best they could to describe what they were seeing, but none of these is going to be very accurate. We'll do the best we can, obviously, is what the artists are telling us, and we appreciate that. In verse 13, I kept looking again. I kept looking. He's studying. He's working hard to understand the vision. In the night visions of behold, with the clouds of heaven, a key phrase, the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days as presented before him. This is not Jaime Schmedlack from Brooklyn. This is not Rabbi Schneerson. Sorry, he's not the Messiah. No offense. This is the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God, fully equal to God, fully man, fully God. Do not, please, accept my comments for gospel. Read it yourself in the scripture. And if you ask me to describe this and explain it, I can not. I can't explain what the scholars have been trying to get at for thousands of years. I can just show you the scripture. But I can tell you that Yeshua is fully man, fully God. He is the agent of creation, as we know in John and also in Colossians. And as I'd like to say, please don't argue with me. Go to the scripture. You'll get your answers there. It's a much better place to be. Anyway, when I first heard of these verses and read them for the first time as a young man, long after my bar mitzvah and any time in the synagogue, I kept asking myself, why wasn't this ever shown to the Jewish children as young boys and as young men? Why didn't the rabbis teach this to us? Why didn't we know about Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel and Jeremiah? Why didn't we really get into some details in the Torah and the Psalms and all of this? Why was it just the bar mitzvah machine, as I like to call it? And the kids would go through this bar mitzvah machine and every week was another friend of yours that went up in front of the congregation, did a few verses, and they were off. We never got into the deeper part of the scriptures. This is critical to our future generations. Critical. The Son of Man is now in the picture. Up to this point, he was not seen as the beasts in Daniel were in view. They, were, they got center stage here. But now the scene shifts. We're only in verse 9 here. We've already covered the rest of it for the most part. These four predominant views on who the Son of Man is, it could be the human view, the angelic view. One is called the collective or personification view, and the other one is the messianic view, and that's the one that I come down with. I believe this is a clear view of the, of the, uh, the Messiah and his appearance. He makes a heavenly statement right there in front of us. The clouds of heaven are a direct reference to the second appearance or second coming of the Messiah. The theme is picked up here and in subsequent verses. Whenever the clouds are mentioned, God is always going to be there. Remember how the children of Israel moved through the desert? They moved with the cloud by day and the fire by night. Fire and clouds always have something to do with God's presence. Take heart in that. Consistent imagery from the beginning to the end through the entire scripture. The clouds of heaven will be here, and we're going to see a little bit more on that as we go through that. One ancient view one of the commentators picked up here, and I wanted just to kind of drop this in there. Joshua ben Levi, 250 CE, so this is obviously in the third century in the common era, said that if Israel deserved it, listen carefully to his words. I pulled this directly from the, sword, from the quote. If Israel deserved it, the Messiah would come with the clouds of heaven, or if otherwise, he would be riding on an ass. Guess what he did? He did both. He came humbly riding on the coal, the colt the foal of an ass. He also comes in the clouds. This is going to be one of the primary things when the Messiah returns that we're going to be able to say, a lot of people are going to say, hey, he's out there in the fields, he's in the desert, he's in the inner room. But this is going to be a sign for all of us that when you see the Messiah in the clouds, you're going to know it's the real deal. Do not be deceived. Do not be fooled. Some cross-referencing there for you. Again, I wanted to 
keep this relatively uh, controlled. In Mark 14, here's a reference now to Yeshua speaking directly to us through the gospel. And then the high priest stood and came forward and questioned Yeshua, saying, do you not offer any answer for what these men are testifying against you? He's on trial. But he kept silent. He didn't offer any answers. Again, the high priest was questioning him and said to him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? You know, when you look at, you watch the Tovia Singer videos or the Michael Skobeck videos, these are uh, rabbis, very well studied. These are the, the anti-missionaries. They will fight with everything they've got to deny Yeshua's existence or his position here. They will always say, well, Jesus never said he was the Messiah. My friends, I beg to differ. He said it a lot, and he said it over and over again, and he said it in a Jewish context, our vision to restore the Jewishness of the gospel. He said it in a way that the people alive at the time would understand it. And this is a good example. The priest said, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And here's his declaration. Yeshua said, I am. No fuzz on that peach. Clear statement. Clear statement. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds. Where did he get that vision? Where did he get those words? Straight out of the book of Daniel. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses. The high priest knew exactly what he was saying. Exactly what he was saying. Yeshua declared himself the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One. Acts 7.56 has a few more things to say about that. We'll move on. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, and then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and after turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, by the way, menorahs, I saw one like the Son of Man, a Son of Man, clothed, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. These are his heavenly garments. Now the end of the beast... Verse 26 of Daniel, as we wrap up the, the session here, but the court will convene for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. The next couple of verses, we have completed the entire Daniel 7 study. But again, you'll notice that these things are not necessarily in the safe, comfortable chronological order that we would like them because God doesn't, he doesn't roll like that. He throws stuff in different places. you got to go chase it. But through the chasing and through the research and through the flipping back and forth between the pages, and maybe a commentary or two if you have a good one, you will find God there waiting for you. He is waiting for you to come to him. Waiting for you to come to him. The court will convene for judgment, and the beast, his dominion, will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. In verse 10, again, not in chronological order, a river of fire was flowing out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were serving him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court convened, and the books were opened. By the way, it says books. Notice. Is your name in the books? Book of Life. Talk about that every year. Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1, and Revelation 4 complete a lot of this imagery for us. Let's move on to chapter or verse 14. The Son of Man will receive the kingdom, and to him was given dominion and honor and kingdom so that all of the peoples, nations, and populations... Look around you. Look around you. Who do you see here? We are represented by more than 12 languages. In fact, I think maybe 13 or 14 languages. We come 
from every continent on the planet, with the exception, I think, of Australia. Unless you're an Aussie, let me know. We are that, right? You see yourself there. This is us. We are part of this. This is not out there somewhere. This is us. And I don't know about you, but I like being part of us. Everybody's looking to belong to something. This is as good as I, as I can think. Every, the peoples, the nations, the populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It is forever. Amen. Now we know who's going to receive the kingdom. It's us, headed by the Messiah. This is, as I'd like to say, as I mentioned before, God's diversity plan. We see a whole lot of diversity mentioned in the text of congressional legislation. It is meaningless. It is all of us. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he has also made the world. Let's move on and complete. Verse 22, until the ancient of days came and the judgment was passed in favor of the saints, the holy ones, of the highest one and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. We are going to take possession of the kingdom. We're moving in, guys, right? We're going to call the moving vans. We're coming in. And whoever's there is going to be pushed out. Good news. Revelation 19.4, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sits on the throne saying, Amen and Hallelujah. Moving on to Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Yeshua. There is going to be a price paid to be a believer during the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel. If you have the testimony of Yeshua, just recognize that this life you're living today is meaningless. In terms of the gifts, the wars, whatever it might be, we are looking for heavenly rewards because everything is going to burn in the fire. To those who have not worshipped the beast, you will be rewarded in his image and have not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. Amen to that. And here's the deal. There will be no more mass shutdowns. There will be no more planes flying overhead. There will be few cars, maybe no cars on the road, no Uber to get where you need to go. The schools will not be shut down because we're going to be learning about the Lord constantly. In fact, at some point in time, Jeremiah tells us we won't have to tell one another about the Lord because he's going to be in our hearts. We won't have to worry about closing businesses. We're not going to have to worry about governments and secretaries of state and presidents and vice presidents because there is going to be one that is going to be on the throne and he will be ruling from Jerusalem. The rest of the dead did not come into life until after the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. The resurrection, by the way, is a historical fact. Even though we haven't had it yet, it's being written as if it already happened. Because guess what? God stands outside of time. He does not have constraints like we do. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from those whose presence earth and heaven fled and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, I saw the dead, the great, the small, standing before the throne. The books were opened and another book was opened, just like we saw a couple minutes ago, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. You know that God knows your thoughts? That terrifies me more than anything else. He knows what I think. So when Christmas time comes every year and you're wondering if there's, everybody's been naughty or nice, I'll just simply tell you, he knows your heart. The believer's bar of soap, John chapter 1, verse 9. Confess your sins. God is faithful to forgive. Every day, we should be on our knees thanking God for the promise he gives us. The saints will receive the kingdom in verse 
18 and Daniel, the saints are the highest one will receive the kingdom, take possession of the kingdom forever for all ages to come. And in verse 27, as we end this vision, then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one, us, this is us, and all the empires will serve and obey him. And last, in verse 28, at this point, the revelation ended. Notice interesting word, revelation. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face became pale, but I kept the matter to myself. You know what? He may have kept the matter to himself then, but we know all of this now. 2,500 years later, we know exactly what was going on in Daniel's head. And what's kind of interesting about this, Daniel's not afraid to tell us. He was terrified. And he's going to repeat the same statement in chapter 8. It's okay to be scared. It's all right. I know we're told not to be anxious, and I get that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Absolutely. But every once in a while, we run into times where we're terrified, we're scared. We don't, you know, the, the unknown is terrifying. But you know the good news is, this is known. And this is what we're going to put our hope in. Final thoughts. The central truth, the main idea, the so what statement, the application. Let's look at that. No matter what we may think, God remains the righteous judge of all. God remains the righteous judge of all. The times of the Gentiles will end, and the world will be judged. The fourth beast will meet his ultimate end in the lake of fire. The remainder or the reminder should cause us to realize that we must reset our personal priorities and focus on God, the one true living God. He will judge the righteous and the unrighteous. The question remains, where do you stand today? We have the gift of knowing the future. When you receive a gift, what do you do with it? And do you send thank you notes when you get one? Please join me in prayer. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word. As we bounce back and forth between Revelation and Daniel and the other prophets, Lord, we thank you, Father, for helping us knit together this amazing tapestry as we search for you with all of our hearts, Lord. Make yourself known to us. May we be honest with you and with one another, Lord, confessing our sins, recognizing, Father, that it is through that forgiveness that we move on. Help us to love one another, even when we are not lovable or they are not lovable. Because, Lord, you've risen above all of this. In fact, Lord, you are risen. You were the first fruits of the dead. We look to you, Father, and we thank you for everything you've done for us. B'shem Yeshua Amen.